that is so cool is it that you can see me now uh we cannot see you ranjanda uh there must be some problems with uh, the connectivity i guess uh, uh we cannot see you your camera is switched off probably now can you see me yeah. no 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 uh okay i see you your voice is okay yeah that's strange because i uh, i think it uh, should have been on the camera i don't know i don't know what's wrong with this but and you can uh, log out and log in again i think that um, be... yeah let me do that let me try to yeah. do that yeah anik are you there anik uh, first i will uh, start the recording and once the record starts you go you can go live we are live we have start, uh, oh okay no problem now ranjan you are you, you are visible now just switch on your microphone okay everything is fine visible and now i'll start the recording mode ha huh? and once the record starts i'll let you know okay you start that so anik we are already live now okay so should i start no i'll let you know let okay. me, the recording should uh, it takes time okay it's taking time mm -hmm. no rush recording has started okay randan ah uh, okay okay so good evening everyone here who is actually either watching me live or it's part of the google room class portal um let me tell you a few things before i begin um it's important for me to say this because this is not this is not a very formal talk that i am doing here because in mm, uh, you, you know what happens in a formal talk is that we just try to produce a written text from which we start to speak from and then of course it gets limited by 40 minutes or 50 45 minutes of presentation before long the questions begin and so it's very difficult to keep track of the person speaking because he or she reads out from a written text sentence after sentence and it's difficult for the for 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 the for the listener or the viewer to really keep pace with that often and it also happens that uh, sometimes you do have a question in your mind which uh, you don't get a chance to ask so this is not the kind of thing i'm very interested in because um, it's 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 been completely schematized in the form of a class lecture so i'm going to do this in a kind of a class lecture mode and um when it comes to a class lecture mode there are a few things that i need to share with you because this is the first one of the eight lectures that i have late class lectures that i have envisaged for this entire course the first thing is that um uh, this will be very informal in nature and uh, whatever questions you have whatever discussion points that you have whatever queries that come to your mind intelligent rigorous stupid whatever it doesn't make any difference to this because it's a classroom so you can just keep asking me about different things that you can want to think about alongside me at the same time i would really appreciate if you disagree with me because um i've always told my students and scholars and my colleagues all the time that disagreement probably and dissent probably is the most important thing in my life because um i have always been suspicious of admirers so this is um this is something that i would love to in a sense that you start to discuss things with me and not necessarily all the time disagree but there are certain points that you want to extend with me or want to know more elaborately from my end i would be ready to do that also 
there are a few other things before since this is the inaugural one class lecture um we are going to talk about we are going to talk about these eight class uh, eight lecture series or rather eight classroom lecture series about what is a literary now um this is a very vague question i mean if you ask this this, this question to anyone for that matter this actually becomes very big because uh, when you say what is literary it can really mean a lot of things like it can bring in the concept of the imaginary it can it can obviously bring in the concept of how you look at totality at the same time you start to see how this whole speciality of formation speciality in the formation of concepts of paradigms come up so literary uh, uh, this is the reason why i chose it literary can of course trigger a lot of questions in your mind it just about produces those haunts of confusion uh, uh setting on which probably you can start to think with me because most importantly uh, for me is this whole idea of the literary is about critical thinking. I don't know exactly what critical thinking really means because this has been one of my governing concerns of late and certainly something that I'm developing as a project at the same time, even truly into a book. It's where exactly do you think that the creative and the critical comes in? Is it that the literary is creative? Is it that the literary is critical? Or is it that there is nothing called creative and critical there is nothing called uh, critical at all because everything that you do, everything that you think or try to work out becomes creative in nature. Or the opposite can be true. I know of people who absolutely don't believe in anything that is creative because anything that is creative for them will all the time be critical. So this is the, this is the uh, real reason why I actually got this idea of the literary into the classroom for these PhD seminars. And um, another point is that um, uh, people who have who have listened to me in the past, I don't talk much online or I don't lecture in seminars, um, but people who have actually heard me know that my class lectures are not in the role of an explicator. I'm not here to really be a, somebody like a guidebook to you. I will not be giving you an idea that after you leave this class today, uh, you will not going to take your notes, whatever notes you take and whatever discussion points you make. You're not going to go home or take home rather that this is the literary. So what I have told you, you just bullet point your understanding or, or, or bullet point your comprehension. And you say that these are the points that comprise of me, what you understand with the literary. That is exactly not the way I teach. That is not exactly not the way I write. So what you're going to get here is a very engaging way of looking at the literary Obviously, there are certain crutches, I call them these days, the theoretical or philosophical or, uh, or thinker crutches that on which you probably can rest on, lean on, and try to develop or understand a certain concept. But at the same time, I think there is also the need for you to think tangentially beyond that point. Because unless you start to grow that kind of a mind where you have that tangential way of understanding things and understanding the way the paradigms actually change, with your understanding, you'll never be able to think. Remember that um, uh, when people, when this whole Americanization of uh, understanding and Americanization of writing, it will require that you give a footnote, every single word that you mention, even if that word is something that you don't know. For instance, you say totality and, uh, and you don't, don't footnote it and somebody can just jump on you and say, oh, that is something that Hegel was talking about. Why didn't you mention phenomenology of spirit there? So, you know, that's the way, that's the kind of framework, that's the kind of an understanding that we have of any kind of a class lecture, any kind of a lecture, any kind of a presentation or a writing. So in this kind of a mode that I'm going to do with you all, it's just not the informality of it, but there'll be lots of things that will keep pouring into the kind of uh, the system of thought that we are going to pr uh, have with in the subsequently in all the lectures that follow this one. And what kind of thinking that would be is that things would come from sciences, things would come from mathematics, things would come from uh, biosemiotics, things would come from the philosophy, things would come from the literature. So there are different kinds of things that would come into this classroom lecture as we progress. And we will see how and what connects you. Is there something, because you know sometimes it does happen, uh, I, 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 I should really interrupt myself to say this, but if one is actually talking about Hegel, for instance, who will of course come in our classroom talk, 
subsequently. Uh, when we start to talk about Hegel, then there might be people who are not interested in Hegel. I mean, how is it important that you have to know your Hegel to understand literature or understand critical thinking? You might not be interested in that. I, I fear enough, I take that. But, you know, in a classroom lecture that I envisage are the kind of things that I want to do with my colleagues, with my scholars, with my students, is that there will be lots of things coming into because um, I am actually somebody who um, I would say a very non-specialist generalist. Um, I don't know what that means, but you can frame your own ideas. A non-specialist generalist. So there are lots of things that from different disciplines that I study that I want to get into my writing and thinking will actually start to pour into this virtual classroom. And then what happens is that you might just take home some pointer idea that you think connects with you, that you think might be used, might be might be elaborated, extended as you move ahead with your work or move ahead with your critical discourse. So this is the, 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 the second part of it. And the third part would be that whenever questions you have, uh, uh, just, just note your questions down, whatever discussion points that you would like to have, you note them down. And uh, the best would be probably if you can get in touch with me after I finish. Um, so it might be a sort of a one and a half hour that I'm going to talk now. And then of course, I'm going to, I'm going to take all your questions, whatever be its nature, just free to ask me because I certainly believe that um, questions cannot have character, questions cannot have class, questions are questions, and it is probably the answers which will have class and character. So you are free to ask questions of very nature, unstriped, un, un, unformalized, unformatted questions that you can keep asking me once this lecture is over. So coming to uh, coming to this point about the literary, um, I would begin with my re reading of the literary, because when I begin with my understanding of the literary, there would be other thinkers, our thoughts that are going to come into our discussion. And then, of course, we would start to elaborate those thinkers and see how I'm looking at this whole idea of the literary. I have a very um, a different position about looking at this literary, I would say different, because I don't believe in the idea of originality. I, I, I always consider if someone is original, then someone is different. So that would be a kind of a different way of looking at the literary. So let me see how I can do that. And I will base my uh, uh, discussion today with you uh, on my very recently published book, I mean, just published last year, and here is the book for you. And uh, it is the called Trans Infusion, and it's, it's it reflections on the critical thinking. Uh, surely when I wrote this book, I thought that there could be a critical thinking, but gradually as I can see myself in the in a couple of years time, probably I would be trying to get rid of this word creative and critical and trying to come up with a different kind of an idea and a theory and philosophy about it. But for the moment, uh, this is a book which I'm going to focus on and explain certain points, certain, certain positions, which I thought was very different in the formation of the literary for you all and see how we respond to the idea of the literary because that's where I'm going to begin. Things can be aligned, there is a kind of a principled way of understanding something. So if you say that this particular room has an aesthetic of its own, then you are trying to look at structure. Now, round of the edges, as I said. Now when you come to imaginary, now when you come to imaginary, then of course the, it is both a kind of a concept which talks about how you imagine things, what are the images that come through your imagination, at the same time it's a container, it's a receptacle. Now when all these things come together, it becomes a sort of a um, different kind of forces to it. And the antinomiality, the kind of the kind of opposition that this imaginary produces is interesting. When you say when you say radical imaginary, when you say psychological or feminist imaginary, even when you start to talk about um, uh, I would even say that uh, Timothy Morton's hyper object would be a kind of an imaginary as well if just one starts to think about it. But when you say aesthetic imagined structures, I, 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 I must interrupt here to begin uh, to say that uh, I, 
I, I was enamored by this post structuralism when I began 20 years ago, thinking that I would be reading and writing on this. But, you know, of late, um, over the last five or six years, or probably seven or eight years now, uh, I, I think this is, this is the, the whole idea of post-structuralism is seriously something that has its own faults. Um, it, is, it, is, it is definitely post-structuralism or this whole idea of trying to break down structures and have a kind of eluvedness about it or a kind of looseness about it is something that doesn't hold up for me anymore. I think what, what, I, what I would like to say, and that is something that we will pick up later when I talk about plastic imaginary, as you very much expect that I'm going to talk about that in, in, in one of my class lectures, and then I start to engage with Malibu, Catherine Malibu, and Hegel, of course. Uh, that would be later, but when one comes to do even plasticity, for that matter, even if, in, even if you start to use the word plasticity and say that uh, different kinds of domains can be explored, different kinds of frontiers can be pushed, and a different kinds of figurations or configurations or refigurations can be made, you always should remember that there is a structure, something that I would hold on to that position, although I'm very ready to take on people who don't believe in that position. But there is always a kind of structure that you are uh, uh, all the time, all the time showing your allegiance to, which of course is the thesis that I have about structure plasticity. Now, this is important that in an aesthetic imaginary there would be structures, one structure in a way enfolding the other. It's, it's, it might be delusion, but also in a sense that it might be additive in nature, it might be calculative in nature, it might be uh, uh, arithmetical in nature. Um, it can also be like the way you start to talk about the word calculus, which actually means pebbles. Um, when you are putting one pebble into the other, I mean, like that you have a pitcher and you're putting one pebble into the pitcher. So you are actually putting a kind of calculative way of seeing how the pitcher has been filled by the pebbles and after a point of time, you lose count of that. So one, you do that is that you start counting the pebbles first when you put into the pitcher. That's number one. And when you start to put the pebbles in, and after a point of time, you will lose count of it. That's the second uh, uh, object that happens, or the rather second event that happens. And the third one is that you cannot discount that there are pebbles in the picture. The counting, and then the uncounting, and then the discounting. So first you count, and then you know that here is a structure. Then suddenly after a point of time, and that is how thinking really progresses, that is how the literary really starts to come to you where you start to lose the structure. You don't know where actually the structures are, where are the ends that you need to tie up, how would the doodle game be played where you start to figure out a diagram or figure out a poetry. That's the second part of it. And the third part is that you cannot discount anything in spite of the fact that you have actually got into an event of encounter. So you know, this is, this is how all kinds of thinking progresses. This is how Actually, when you look at any kind of a literary or any kind of an imaginary, this is how it goes. This is my way of looking at it where you see the counting, the uncounting, and then discounting all coming together to really share a space and produce its own dynamics. Now, aesthetic imaginary then is a complicated phenomenon because it's a complicated phenomenon because it starts to bring in different kinds of ideas and different kinds of paradigms within a form some may be formless some may be forming some are transforming so you know all these different states of events start to happen within the aesthetic imaginary how transfer that to cultural studies for that matter just to see how this idea can be used for cultural studies for instance if you if you are looking at identity or if you're looking at the whole idea of cosmopolitanism. It is very much a part of the aesthetic imaginary that I'm proposing here, because once you, once you start to talk about, say, um, cosmopolitanism, then you come up with all those uh, ideas that I'm not getting into, those uh, rooted and unrooted, bounded, unbounded, the Kantian, the Apayan, all kinds of things that you bring into your cosmopolitanism. I'm not getting to that because that's not the uh, part of the classroom lecture today. But what, what I'm trying to say is that this idea of trying to, trying to get this counting, this uncounting, and the discounting paradigm into the understanding of cultural studies, and hence how this cosmopolitanism or secularism or syncreticism or different kinds of ideas that you bring into your understanding of the world around, even violence for that matter, uh, would all the time have its own aesthetic imaginary. So is it that, is it that 
uh, violence, uh, secularism, um, contemporary political thinking, extremism, maybe totalitarianism. Uh, do you think all these are part of the literary? They are. These are these. This this is a different sort of literary that we are because you know the the common the common lapse that probably will have that when we use the word literary. This is where I just want to take you away a little. Again, I said you might disagree, but I'm going to take you away from that. That if one actually looks at the word literary, then the the whole body about the literariness literature comes to your mind. But this is where I'm just going to unhinge this concept here for you all. Um, it is it is obviously important that you look at the literary from the aspect of literature, you know, literary studies, theories of literature. But at the same time, the unhinging part is also important where you start to in a way unveil the concept in a different mode, in a different way. And it is then what the word literary starts to have its own circulation and momentum. One thing um, that I would uh, I would very much like to tell you all here is that the literary the literary is is a dynamic. The literary is a kind of a it's 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 a kind of a structure which has its own modes of expression which you can relate to everything. Like um, a little controversially, but yes, I would love to get into that area to say this. Literary can be, of course, important for your DNA studies. Literary, literary can be genomic in nature. It can be genetic in nature. It can be the whole idea of the mathematical constant, or it can say the kind of a random or chance that comes into mathematical thinking. Literary can also be a way of looking at the whole dialectic that one sees between secularism and it's in opposition that you say opposite have a disclaiming attitude to it some so at the same time with a semi-appropriate demi-appropriate that's a semi-appropriate demi-appropriate that's a para-appropriate these are the things that start to come in in the whole discussion so the geometric way of thinking opposite it that's that's the point i was trying to tell you the geometric way of thinking opposite doesn't exist here. for me the first integral once you frame a literary you start to move into the whole dynamics of the opposite in it. So anything that happens, say, for instance, is the local, is the local, the, uh, the literary, if you say yes, you would immediately say the local. Which one would be the local? One that is closest to my body, one that is closest to my situation, one that is closest to my existence. Is that the local or is it that uh, Everything about India is local and everything about the US is the global. I mean, how would you like to see the local and the global? Is it that the, the, what you see as the US or the non-Indian part is the global? Is it the opposite to the Indian part that is the local? Or where do you see the local in different kinds of layers of understanding as you try to understand the concept? So what happens is the very word local is opposite to its locality. The very word local is opposite to its localness. This very word opposite is, or rather, sorry, the, the word local is opposite to its very local understanding of things. So if the word local is opposite to localness and locality, then the interesting thing is local is all the time self-oppositional in nature. That is, you don't have to bother much about seeing um, you don't really have to bother much about, uh, uh, oh, this is local, so the opposite would be global. Or there is a global, so the opposite would be local. That's what I'm challenging here. That's what I'm not asking you to uh, 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 actually understand. The point. My point, of, obviously, of course, was uh, subject to your disagreement. But I'm not telling that there's a local opposite is the global. What I'm saying, the local is by itself its own opposite. There is a kind of self-opposition in the very word local, which is why, you know, uh, why I'm saying this, because um, um, I, I, I think this is, this is in a way, uh, connects me better with this French thinker Michel Serre. And Michel says the very idea of the powerful local as local can produce in the understanding of the global. And the, 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 very, the very undifferentiated understanding of the local and global is something that I've always challenged through my writings and something I'm still challenging at this moment. 
And I'm just, just very interested to see that this very idea of the literary then, I was just giving you the instance of the local here, the very idea of that literary then is ingrained, is embedded in the term opposite. So we begin with this idea of the opposition, but uh, I remember something that this opposition um, is a little romantic in nature as well, in a sense that uh, if you go back to Samuel Coleridge's writings, uh, Coleridge uh, talks about this opposite, and all romantic thinking, for that matter, is very oppositional, antinomial in nature. And uh, uh, remember that uh, romantic thinking, when you basically talk about the secondary imagination, the secondary imagination primarily, fundamentally, is extremely uh, oppositional in nature because you start into the understanding of a certain idea. I mean, and this, this, this very idea of the secondary imagination would be, for me, uh, a kind of a kind of an counting and uncounting of things coming together to produce an idea. Like, um, uh, uh, if one looks at a classical imagination or neoclassical imagination, there is very much a sort of a formulaic understanding of things, a kind of a paradigmatic, a kind of a structural understanding of things. But when it comes to opposite forces, there are these oppositionalities that start to fill the space that that you develop to understand a certain thing or your relationship with nature or surroundings. So romantic imagination is something where this uh, the word opposite comes. But of course, it has its own trajectory to which we are not going at this moment. And uh, uh, certainly uh, uh, one reference that I can give you here is that if you are talking about this opposition from the cold rigid standpoint or the romantic aesthetics, uh, you can also when you uh, try to understand within this uh, 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 especially in the last 20 or 25 years where uh, so much of so much of natural sciences have got into your understanding of the literary or understanding of literature or humanities the idea of superimposition because um, uh, this superimposition is extremely important where um, when you talk about imposition then you really talk about someone hegemonizing your position or someone in a way you're being imposed on in this case, somebody who is uh, extremely influential or has a lot of impact to really throw about, then that person is impositional in nature. But what is this superimposition? And the superimposition is not about you layering up like a club sandwich where you're putting things up one and the other. That is not the superimposition. The point, uh, the, the point of the matter is that we already are superimposed beings. We already are superimposed consciousness. We already are superimposed literary. The literary is all the time superimposed. You don't need to bring things back into uh, the literary domain and put things one after another. This superimposition that is very much the ontology, very much the essence, is very interesting. Because this superimposition is not about, very interesting. Because this superimposition is not about this additive, qualitative congruity that you see between different paradigms. Calculative, formulaic, structured, prescribed way of looking at things. This superimposition is very oppositional in nature. And, um, not really in the, the in the sense of a Hegelian dialectic here, but uh, uh, but certainly uh, something that I might I will talk later about a negative dialectic here, where you, you start to see the superimposition working uh, as a kind of an opposition to the every layer that comes in. We are layered, but we are layered in opposition. We are layered, but we are layered in dissonance. We are layered, but we are layered in disjointed parts. How is that making? How do you make bricks? So this whole idea of this brick making is something that talks both about the geometry and the ungeometricization. You figure something out, commensurability, you unmake that. That is, instability is not disconnected from some incommensurability is the unmaking process that goes on. The unmaking process is probably the most important because that is the source and that is where the function of creativity lies. Uh, Simon then, how, how he brings about this particular idea of the uh, 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 individuation. Now, um, what he's trying to do here is with the individuation is that he is trying to produce a kind of a traversing, a traversing of the domains of, say, the physics, the biology, the
and skin that, that we started to start to think about Anthropocene as a discourse and start to think how we can build our relationship with nature. It was very much there. Even if you go back to the romantics, I mean, if you, if you, if you really the romantics concepts of nature, there is Anthropocene very much involved. So, you know, this free individuality of a concept of the Anthropocene that you're talking about very much existed before you come to this concept of Anthropocene now that you are talking about, which actually means that the word Anthropocene was not there before Anthropocene, but Anthropocene as a literary, Anthropocene as a structureless structure, Anthropocene as a momentum, Anthropocene as a connective potential conceptual entity was very much there. That cannot be denied. That was always there and that actually contributed to what we have today. So interesting, uh, uh, what we can really say this is that the literary then is simply not about the individuality. Literary is also about the pre-individuality, something that you are not aware, something that you are not affected by, but whose reach and process uh, really, in a way, gets into your uh, understanding of the concept which you say as the individuality say the Anthropocene for that matter, or for instance, one that we are talking about now. But what is this individuation? Uh, when one talks about this individuality, um, are we really in the, in, in the, are we really held up with Anthropocene or now uh, we start to talk about the good Anthropocene, the bad Anthropocene, we talk about the post Anthropocene, we, we, we start to talk about no Anthropocene. I mean, there is absolutely no Anthropocene. Uh, People, there are some disbelievers. I mean, there are people who don't believe that there is Anthropocene there. And, you know, uh, uh, this, these kind of things would actually come in after this Anthropocene as a kind of an individuality, as a kind of an individuality event happens. This is the individuation. Individuation is where the suddenly an identity, a concept, it starts to have its own flux it starts to have its own laminarity. It starts to have its own ways of loosening up the edges. It starts to have its own boxes created, which you never thought were there within. So, you know, this kind of, this kind of unfolding disclosure, uh, you can say the, 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 the whole of disclosive thinking, I mean, with this undertone of Heidegger, I mean, this disclosive thinking that you see is very much there within a particular identity or concept or a paradigm. This is the individuation. And, and, and it is very important for us to understand that any kind of a concept, any kind of an idea that you're talking about will have its own migrancy to it. And what is that migrancy? The migrancy was there before the concept was. So it's a kind of a pre-conceptual, pre-identity migrancy because that's the way the whole migrant formations, the migrant transformations, the, the, the migrant flux and the migrant thesis were formed. And then once you have that concept with you, once you have that idea with you, the migrancy continues. And this is the, not the processuality of thinking, you would call it the post-processuality of understanding. And this is the post-processuality which starts to create its own forms of expression. It starts to create its own forms of manifestation. And this is the individuation. And this is what Gabriel Sandon would call the transduction. And this transduction is something that creates this kind of spirituality of thinking, the spirituality of understanding. So what he does here is that he breaks down, he breaks down the division between commensurate and incommensurate. That is exactly my, my thesis um, uh, uh, as I get into uh, writing on the world literature, where this is also some, some finishing a book now. And this is where I just want to introduce the whole idea about how this whole idea of commens incommensurability starts to build the world literature. And very interestingly, if you go back to Goethe, uh, or, 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 or if you really go to the post garter period where they are talking about this world literature as network, as connecting, as trying to reach out to things, almost uh, uh, a kind of a kind of a, a throwback on uh, uh, the actor network theory. I mean, that's that's the way if you are looking at this connector that Goethe is talking about, I think it's a failure. That is where, that is how exactly not world literature should work because uh, the whole 
the whole difficulty about the whole difficulty about the literary of our literature is that it is completely misread the local there 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 is a way of understanding how this local works and once you start to frame about this idea about decoloniality and try to bring the local and the global into a kind of an oppositional matrices i think the project for me fails because um uh, there has to be a way of reading the literary in what you call a world literature category, which I uh, personally don't believe in. It's where this whole idea of the literary, it is seriously something that talks about this incommensurability of understanding. You have an unease about certain things. You are, you are having a kind of a dystopic contentment about reading literature. Let us put it this way. There is a kind of a dystopic dystopic contentment about reading. I mean, dystopia should really be disappointed, but I'm not saying that. Dystopic, dystopic contentment about reading something, and that is exactly where the entropic energy of the system lies. That is where the system starts to break down. That is where you start to see that the system really invites its own destruction. This is um, something that um, very easily you can associate with Nietzsche or you, you, you can obviously uh, understand, put it down to um, the various, the, the French continental part of I mean, after the 1920s to the 1950s, which starts talking about this breaking down. But for me, this is one part of the literary, the individuation that Gilman did, Simon Gilman is talking about. Now, Gilbert Simon did um, Individuation leads me to two kinds of ideas, which are obviously something that I want to share with you, my own ideas about uh, how one looks at the literary. Is the literary for you concrete or is the literary for you liquid? Now, this is a part that um, I, I would like to talk to you about because um, whenever we are talking about the literary, we are talking about an equilibrium. And um, uh, what is this equilibrium? This equilibrium can be of various types. One equilibrium can be the stable equilibrium that is all of us want to be in. For instance, this understanding of the local, as I said, the local and the global. So you say, oh, I'm going to localize or I'm going to globalize, or you say globalization and literature. For me, that's a very, very stable equilibrium. That, that, that is something that you can rest in without the unease. Then comes the question of the disequilibrium. I mean, Bartolome Fee would, would, be, would be talking about this disequilibrium and disequilibrium in a sense that you break the equilibrium, you try to disrupt the structure, you try to detonate a kind of a disturbance in the way you start to think about a certain things. I agree with that. That is also a way of looking at the literary. I agree with that. That's, a, that's also a different way of understanding things. So when you say that I don't believe this. I do believe this, and almost like this, this, this not. Uh, I do not. The the bottle by phenomenon starts to come in, and then you start to produce a sort of disequilibrium in anything that you see. So um, the the disequilibria can be one of the ways of looking at a certain concept that you don't agree with, or you have different. Uh, 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 I would say counter, or in a way counter circulation that you want to bring into an understanding. And the third part that interests me the most, and uh, this is where I, I, I really pitch my tents in, and that's where you call it the meta-equilibrium. Now, this meta-stable equilibrium is a very interesting phenomenon. Let me tell you this before I start to talk about what I mean by concrete and liquid text. Um, I would just halt a little because it's not a talk. It's a classroom lecture. I mean. Am I being comprehensible? Are you people, uh, since I've been talking for almost an hour now, are you being able to get the points that I'm trying to make? I would be happy if there are some few responses popping up on my screen so that it really inspires me to go ahead further. Um, this is um, uh, this is one, uh, thank you, thank you for that. I mean, I, I'm just trying to, trying to figure out whether you people are actually getting my ideas or thoughts, actually. This is important for me to know because there are such a complicated ideas that are uh, that have been put across. So it's always nice to really get some um, feedback. So coming to this idea of um, metastable equilibrium, um, 
this is the most interesting part about it. And uh, let me explain this to you. Uh, you know, what happens in a metastable equilibrium is that uh, everything seems to be in equilibrium. Please note the word I'm using. It is equilibrium, it is disequilibrium, but um, if it is, if it is, it seems to be in equilibrium, then the problem arises. Because if you say it seems to be in equilibrium, then you know there must be some concealed factor, some kind of an actant that hides within, which might disrupt what you see as the reality of the equilibrium. So, you know, what happens is that in a metastable equilibrium, anything can change with the slightest change of a factor within that particular formation. Uh, for instance, uh, if one formation needs to change, then there has to be some radical change, some groundbreaking change, some strong change, some feeble change, uh, 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 maybe some minor change, maybe some major change, so that the whole structure or the condition changes, whether it's the thought, whether your understanding, whether it's kind of a cultural reality, whatever. Um, but when it comes to the idea of the metastable equilibrium, you know, as I said, slightest of change, the most feeble, the most feeble change uh, that you get to see can really change the flow, the structure, the state of things for you. So it is not what you get to see that there is this is a stable equilibrium or this is an unstable equilibrium. When you say metastable equilibrium, it seems that everything is okay. Everything's all right. But uh, something can really go off right, something will really go off axis if there is the slightest, feeblest of change that happens. This is where the real, the, the real idea of the literary lies. And this is the interesting part about transduction because any kind of transductive understanding of things would actually mean that rest assured, you do have a center, you do have an essence. Um, this way, I'm actually not going into deconstruction at all because I think uh, Derrida uh, uh, has been very misunderstood over the years. Um, he never said, he never said that there is no essence or there is no center. There is that center, there is that essence, but the point of the matter is that somewhere these are vulnerable. Now, can I call it, can I call it that uh, when we are thinking, we are not talking about no center, decenter, recenter, uh, an disrupted center, uh, unhinged center. Can I call it the fragile center. I mean, I um, uh, can I call this to be a sort of uh, a very fragile center, a vulnerable center? Because you know, this word the vulnerable, it comes from the word vulnus, which actually means wound. That is when you hurt someone. So if that wound remains in you, that wound can erupt or manifest in different forms later. Sometimes you can hide your wound, but maybe the, the curative period that it takes might vary. Something might manifest out of it which you are not sure about. So maybe that vulnerable center is very much there in metastable equilibrium. So this is where the understanding of the literary becomes important where another category that I'm bringing into the literary after I said opposite and opposition and then I said the, the idea of individuation and um, and also the question about uh, the, the, the idea of this metastable equilibrium and now I say the vulnerable center that literary any idea of the literary will have but this brings me to something that I would like to theorize here for you all is this idea of the concrete and the liquid. Um, you know, there has been, um, there has been this, this, this idea of the concrete and the liquid when, uh, when, I, when I start to speak to you about it. Um, Phil Hegel and Marx, they really talk a lot about the, the fluid and the molten state and the solid a lot in their writings. And that is not the point here. That is something that uh, we can take up later. But what I'm interested in is to see that can there be two kinds of uh, uh, concept about a concrete literary, uh, liquid literary, 
And there is a concept that I introduced. It's, it's, it's a term that you can use together. It's called liquid concrete. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying separately. I'm not saying liquid concrete. I'm saying liquid concrete. Almost like Karen Barrett talking about the space-time matrix. It's, it's, it's a word that comes together. Uh, seriously denounced by the, by the dictionary, but uh, something that can, of course, form part of your vocabulary. So when uh, Barrett talks about the space-time matrix, then it's, it's a way of multitudinous, simultaneous, at the same time, a kind of, um, a, a, kind of a, way, a, a kind of a way of seeing how everything really falls in place at the same time, where there is very difficulty, there is a lot of difficulty actually to separate between the space, the matter, and the time. So it's a space-time matterings. That's the way it comes in. So mattering is all about how you collapse space and time. So um, it is almost in that uh, uh, sort of a fashion. I I would like to say that there is not concrete or the or, 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 or the liquid, but I would say it's liquid concrete. Now, when you say liquid concrete as a kind of a concept, then what kind of liquid concrete are you talking about? What kind of a concept is that? Let me explain this to you. Um, a little and see whether I can really make some sense here. Um, Simonton is actually uh, uh, talking about uh, this idea of the coming together. And when he talks about coming together, he is generally talking about elagomatism. I mean, it's elagomatic. Elagomatism is, is, is a way of how you try to bring things together, like um, um, if you go back to to understand this word alagma, then uh, obviously it means thing taken in exchange, and then it stems from the word alasite, which means actually to exchange and barter, and the word alos actually means another. So when you talk about alagmatism, then it is it is it is the first thing that you take is things taken in exchange. That's the first one. And then, of course, it comes to at a kind of you're exchanging barter. That's what you're doing. And at the same time, there is the idea of the another. All three coming together in this idea of the allagmatism. And this allagmatism is about uh, very much a part about um, dynamicism, or you can call it a kind of a metamorphosis. You can call it um, always a uh, provocative energy for apparent or, or sustained disruption. But remember, something that I clearly believe that it is also a principled understanding of structuralism. Remember that um, whenever you whenever you talk about stable, unstable, metastable equilibrium, it's all about structure. There is no way that, uh, uh, I mean, off late, my position is very clear and sharp, that I do not see anything in this world, any kind of an idea existing without a structure. Even if um, my recent work that I'm doing on random, and especially on art, um, I'm still seeing that the whole idea that even if random is there, it's a very rational random. Even if there is a chance, it is a very reasonable chance. So you know, you cannot you cannot you cannot deny structure to really think about something. It's a very difficult thing to do. Uh, although it's a very lucrative and at the same time a very tempting thought to believe in. I'm telling you that you, you just about feel that well, something doesn't have a structure, so you're very tempted by that idea. But the underlying thing is that everything would have a principled understanding of structuralism. So allegmatism would have that with uh, very much in it. But the difference that I uh, am trying to talk to you about is that when it comes to when it comes to Simonton, then Simonton is talking about uh, the idea of field. I mean, the field. Well, it could be a magnetic field, it could be a cultural field, it could be a political field. But he's talking about field. And in that field, he's uh, actually appropriating the properties of the magnetic field, where there are three magnets in the three corners of the room. There are three magnets in the three corners of the room, and they are all introduced with a non-magnetic piece of iron. So uh, I repeat this for you. There is a magnetic field where there are three magnets in three corners of the room, and this is introduced with a non-magnetic piece of iron. Now, what happens here is that this changes the field of interaction where the structure of the magnetic field changes. Uh, this, this produces 
the difference in structure of the magnetic field. And what the difference does it make? The difference is that the fourth element, that is when I was talking about this non-magnetic piece of iron, that also gets magnetized. Now, something that I was not, I become. Uh, something that you did not consider as the literary becomes the literary. Something that you did not consider the local becomes the local. Something that you always felt is outside the purview of the global becomes the global. So, you know, this is the way of how you magnetize, magnetize the unmagnetic element in your understanding. And this is the transduction force, or you can call it the transductive force that you bring into your understanding of thinking. And importantly enough, this is the exchange. How uh, three magnets and there is one uh, that is on non-magnetic iron piece. Now what happens here? There is an exchange between the three. There is an exchange that goes on. And what kind of exchange? First is that you say exchange, the crossover, and then you drop the X, so it becomes change. So what happens? The non-magnetic is magnetized. So in the exchange, there is the change. So, you know, it is almost like, as I, as, as I told you, that in the synchronicity, there is the asynchronicity. In the causality, there is the ecosality. There in the local is the global. The global has the local. You just cannot in any way distinguish and produce an opposite paradigms to understand the common. So the whole question of this exchange comes in and what happens to this transductive interiority? Let me, let me, let me use this. I, I'm avoiding, avoiding technical words as much as I can, because that's not, about, that is not really the purpose of this, uh, uh, this lectures. Uh, even if you're using this term transductive interiority, then what is this transductive interiority doing? It is producing what you can technically call ontogenesis. Now, ontogenesis is both about the migrancy from one point to another, then also the same time that you are talking about the, the, the idea of the exchanging, then you talk about change, and then you talk about coming together, coming together, and coming together at the same time. This is, the, this is where your understanding has to, has to work on coming together, A coming to B, B coming to A, but at the same time, coming together as an event. And uh, 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 later, of course, we might we might uh, talk a little more about Badiou and uh, uh, there's those ideas about this, uh, the multiplicities that he talks about that exist within an event, but that's when the occasion arises, that's many things will come into the lectures in the forthcoming weeks. So this is, this is what, I, I call the idea of understanding something within an allegmatic concept. Now, in allegmatic concept, you cannot differentiate between the concrete and the liquid. This is the this is the idea with which probably I I, I will end uh, because one and a half hour is good enough. So it is it is this idea of the allegmatism where you start to differentiate between the concrete and the liquid. I do not say concrete and the liquid anymore. I say liquid concrete. And when I say liquid concrete, uh, it is about this brick making, the, the, the molding and the packing of the clay into the mold. That is a very interesting understanding of sand. I read from that so that I can, I, I can have a better understanding of what you people are trying to get at. What I read out of this is that um, there is a process of becoming in which a potential in the system made up a mold hand clay is actualized according to the positivity of taking form to which none of the components is privileged as determining. Any of the component that starts to produce the clay, it starts to produce the form, um, that is not considered as a determining. Like if it has to be ABC, then A and B and C, they are not considered as determining factors. It's only when they are coming together, it's when they are allegmatically combined, it is then that they are considered to be contributing to the A, B, C. Now, this is where the individuality is dropped and individuation comes up into the open. 
Also, you might put it this way, that this technical operation depends on learned brick making skills, on knowledge of the right kind of clay and how it is made ready, the efficient type of mold to use and the energy required in the form of an amount of work. It is because of all these elements that are conjoined in a relation of reciprocal becoming or actualization. This is the reciprocal becoming or actualization, which actually doesn't mean that A reciprocates B exactly like the way B reciprocates A. There is a serious amount of disequilibrium between these two components all the time. So this is where the mold, hand and clay, they come together in a constitutive action, in a constitutive relation, but this relation does not stay as a relation. This stays technically, technically, you may call this as relationality. The relationality is something that becomes extremely important when I'm using this term liquid concrete. Now, what does that do then? Your cultural thinking, your political thinking, your epistemological thinking, whatever thinking that you try to do across disciplines, whether you're thinking about borders, whether you're thinking about partition, whether, you, whether you're thinking about any kind of a cultural category, whether you're thinking about nature, all these would require this idea of the liquid concrete that I, I, I'm trying to establish here. So in, no, in this, in this uh, uh, liquid concrete state, what one does is that it is, does not necessarily mean that it is a more than individual phenomenon. Like, for instance, um, if I say A plus B plus C producing ABC, that looks very decent, that looks very fair. But uh, would that mean that this ABC, if A is not a determining factor in ABC, rather A being with B and B with C and C with B and B with A and ABC together and ABC coming together as not ABC but CBA, that's the kind of a mesh that's the kind of a flux, that's the kind of a metastability that I'm talking about. That would create the ABC. Then the interesting part is that when you look at the word, look, sorry, this, this literary, the literary has a sort of a extremely complicated imaginary to it. And this imaginary, uh, before, before I, I, I finish this, this imaginary would have one little aspect to this. And this is the final point. Uh, we will carry on this in the next class. The, the point about it is that we are very interested in the membrane. Now, what is a membrane? That's, uh, that's also something that uh, I have discussed and I have theorized as well. One is that if you are talking about the way I did, A plus B plus C, C plus B plus A, AB plus C, or BC plus A. So there are so many different structures, as I said, that any kind of the literary will have different kind of structures formed into it, enfolded into it. So if it is such a kind of a dynamic, restless entanglement that you're talking about, then the interesting part is that you start to ask me the question about, am I losing the center? Is it that you spoke about a vulnerable center? You spoke about a fragile center? Or is that we are losing it almost all the time? So where is the center? This is where the idea of the membrane comes in. Because you know every kind of thinking that you do needs to have a form. I mean, even if you're thinking nonsensically, nonsense is a form. And when you are thinking nonsensically about something, then that nonsensicality of production also needs a kind of sensibility of form structures because you cannot produce nonsensibility or nonsensibility in a sense of uh, nonsense without actually putting up a logic of sense in your understanding of things. So interestingly then, you need to produce this idea of the membrane. What does a membrane do? The membrane has this ability of differentiating thoughts. It does differentiate thoughts because membrane actually becomes a way of separating A and B. But when it separates A and B, it performs three functions. First function is that it separates A from B or B from A. So it doesn't encourage any kind of a free flow of A and B. So if it doesn't encourage free flow, it actually means that 
A's identity and B's identity are maintained. There is a way of attesting, attesting if you think about the membrane, there is a way of attesting the identity of A as against B or B against A. That's one. The second thing that a membrane does is that the membrane starts to regulate the flow of the transfusion between A and B. The membrane decides how much of A that is on the other side can reach B or how much of B can really enjoy the absorption of the A. So the membrane actually becomes this kind of a deciding, a determinant factor in a way it starts to discuss about the flux and the flow. That's the, another part of how you start to talk about the membrane. And the third part is that the membrane also wants to separate A and the B, but at times the membranic structure fails and there are certain percolations that go from A to B and B to A. Please note what I'm saying. There are three stages that I've I'm theorizing for you. First is that the membrane that differentiates and there is a kind of a segregation and succession of A and B. The second part is that the membrane becomes a deciding determinant factor, the decider that decides that A and B, how much of A would get into B and how much of B can A enjoy cohabiting with. So this is the second part of it. And the third part that I'm talking about is when the membrane by itself becomes a failure. When the membrane realizes that there is, it's, 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 it's a victim of its own vulnerability. When there are certain things that percolate from A to B and B to A, producing, uh, well, well, you can call it the derivative contamination if you really want to. So this is where the membrane comes in. So the membrane, in a way, refuses to become a certain clear, structured understanding. Membranic thinking, this is what I call it, membranic thinking actually becomes a way of seeing how this literary now becomes a way of understanding, not, not, not simply about serious identity differences, not also the identity in process, but at the same time, losing control over the formations of the identity. So what happens here in membranic thinking, if you connect that with the literary, is that there are certain thoughts that you can structure. There are certain thoughts that you can structure and differentiate with others. And there are certain thoughts that you structure and then you realize that the very structuration is itself its own vulnerability. It's itself its own weakness. It's itself its own disintegration. So when such a thing happens, then anything that you see around has a kind of structure, structurality, and structuration to it, all three coming together to produce what you actually call the literary. So if you say that um, uh, that this, this idea about that uh, how, how this literary can be formed, say whether it's secular, whether it's religion, whether it's nature, whether it's Anthropocene, whether you, whether you talk about this idea of transnationality, all these are literary for me and this literary can really be understood through these particular concepts that i just mentioned now although there are a lot many coming up in my next class sessions with you but um, i would like to end here uh, by saying that um, um this liquid concrete that i spoke about here is just not a category this liquid concrete is both about being solid, being liquid, being not solid, being not liquid, being somewhere in between, all three things coming together. And anything that you consider as liquid concrete will have this membranic thinking to it. Anything that uh, you call it the literary, whether it's the secularism or the secular nature, uh, a violence or migrancy or hybridity or fundamentalism, whatever way you look at the literary, the membranic thinking is something that starts to actually create your clarity at the same time, your status, and at the same time, your voice of understanding. I leave you people here um, with this uh, this much today. It was a one and a half hour is pretty enough, but I will be happy, very happy to take questions here if you if you do have any. Um, just uh, just give me. Uh, just a second so that I can just connect this with my computer. My computer is running out of battery. I'll, I'll, I'll be just taking your question. Just hold on.
Yes, I'm back, so you can, uh, you can ask me questions now. Surely, questions you have. I, there were a lot of there are some questions that popped up, but I'm sorry I was talking so I missed out on them. Um, can you repeat those questions? I'll be happy if you if you switch on your microphone and ask me as well. There is no problem there. Uh, good evening, uh, Professor Gosh, I'm Unradha here. Yeah, Unradha. Yes. Uh, so I was uh, I had already written down the question, but then. And uh, since you happen to miss it, I would just like to ask, uh, I'm very intrigued, uh, uh -huh. you know, with this concept of uh, this liquid concrete and yeah. uh, this coming together, as you say, mm -hmm. uh, could you just uh, explain or just, you know, uh, uh, tell me how it is uh, different from or similar to Coleridge's idea of uh, the literary imagination being as in plastic? Oh, yeah. Um Look, uh, the point uh, is that there there is a distinction because um, when 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 this particular word is used like S in plastic, then it does have a kind of uh, genealogy because this word S in plasticism has a kind of a tradition in in, in German aesthetics before Coleridge starts to appropriate that. Mm -hmm. So what he actually does there is that. He is talking about the plasticization, the plasticization in the sense that he's. And plasticos is all about molding, how you start to mold a certain things, how you try to sculpt a certain things. But interestingly, if one looks into the, the tradition of uh, the, the idea of plastic, and plastic has a very different progression over the, over the years in terms of its, uh, in terms of its conceptual and theoretical growth. The first is that when it comes to plastic as a molding, that was the first part of its growth. Then the second part of its growth is primarily with uh, uh, the and the plastic as sculpting. So, you know, it is uh, less of molding than less of it's about sculpting. If plastic is most about malleability, like the way the Greeks would look at it, that is when you look at the liquefaction of certain things moving one moving into the other if that is what is that is what is the pre-garden way of understanding plastic post garden post garden understanding of plastic is sculpting where the whole agency changes the agency of understanding certain things changes and when one actually does the sculpting then the idea of agentializing a certain product or a certain production that particular thing changes. Something that um, very interestingly, uh, Hegel um, uh, moves away from this understanding of the plastic of Goethe and something that Catherine Malabo picks up later to talk about forming. You know, first, when you talk about plastic, that's, the, this, the, the, that's about the malleability. Then the second stage of understanding is about sculpting. And the third part about is the forming. They don't say formed, they say forming. So in case of Coleridge, it is about sculpting certain things. In a case of SM plasticization of certain things. And this has a very, very, very strong, formidable and well invested uh, 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 history of ideas coming from the German aesthetics. It's primarily aesthetics being spoken about a kind of a structuration, a kind of structural way of looking at certain things. So Coleridge's SM plastic will not have this liquid concrete element to that. Coleridge's understanding would, would be something where you are trying to transform certain things in a kind of and a kind of a productive kinetic way of producing from one stage to another. So this is something that um, uh, Coleridge would actually do uh, when, he, when he's talking about his in plasticism. But you know what Coleridge's idea will not be able to clarify is the question about the exchange that I spoke about, the question of the allegmatism that I spoke about as a kind of a combination of the pre-individual, the individual and the individuation. So Coleridge's idea would primarily be about how one sculpts out a product one, product two, three, four, five into a product six. But the formation is where the difference lies. The, the formation is about a different lies. When I say this, I mean that Coleridge would be a way of 
producing or rather the productionist metaphysics of Coleridge would be about creating a structure out of different structures that come into play and the liquid concrete concept that I'm talking about is where there is always the vulnerability of something happening there any time and uh, something that Coleridge will not connect with the metastable equilibrium at all. For Coleridge, it would primarily be the transformative aspect of looking at ism plasticism. For me, it is more about the allegmatism of looking at plastic. So that's the difference basically that exists. Yes, yes, I, I, I understand. Thank you so much, uh, Professor. Hello, Rangina. Yes, yes. Uh, we have some questions here and on yeah. YouTube as well. Yeah. Now, uh, I think I can ask the questions on their behalf. Yeah, sure. And Ognibo Maiti has asked a very long and lengthy question. Mm -hmm. I request Ognibo to ask your question. On yes. Your yeah, that is better. To keep it short. Yeah. Two yeah. paragraphs. Oh. Ognibo, just unmute your microphone and ask the question. Ognibo, are you there? Okay. We can go to the next question. Yeah. I think I should ask Shubhayu Bhattacharya's question. Yeah. The idea of the three stages is also somewhat indicative of a tussle, opposition between humanism and post-humanism in the sense that while the detonation of the rounded of ages will require cognition of the entropic X, it might also require certain conditions within bracket on which human agency is dependent for such a cognition? Um, um, well, I think um, uh, the Shubhai's question, uh, well, Shubhayu, I mean, try to try to try to uh, rephrase your question because I get you, I get what exactly what you're trying to say, but try to rephrase the question so that uh, people here on the portal can also understand what you are aiming at. Shibha, you can ask the question. Yes, that is better because I know what you are what you are trying to say, but rephrase the question so that people can understand and I can respond, and there can be an engagement. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, I was uh, there. Are basically, I mean, for the shortage of space, I was not able to convey yeah, yeah. actually two things that are uh, relevant to this discussion. Mm -hmm. One is the question of the three stages that you proposed. Uh, related to pre-individuality, individuality, and then individuation. Yeah. Uh, this got me thinking about the question of, not really the question, it is like the confounding of the opposition between agency and non-agency. Hmm. Because uh, to be able to figure out the X, and I use the word X because we do not really know what might cause hmm. a certain system to give off right. or give way to something else hmm. uh, w when we want to figure out the x are we not also uh, maybe overlooking the question of agency in the sense some will because of certain conditions be that be that social or historical or cultural or linguistic as it may may not be able to figure you know might not be able to figure out that particular x or many such x's which in turn is required for the edges to be, you know, dismantled or the rounding off to yeah, be squared. Yeah. So okay. To speak. Uh, yeah, I get you. I get you. What you're trying to say, I get you. But the the, the answer to this is would be would be would be very straight and clear. Uh, when you are talking about agency, then the whole idea of the neo-materialist turn in thinking, uh, if one looks at the neo-materialist turn in thinking then you would see that this idea of agency doesn't necessarily have to be anthropogenic anymore. Because if, um, if plants can think, then the interesting part is that I don't decide whether a plant thinks or not. I mean, the plant can plant things because the plant thinks. And so long, what we have been doing is that we as the, 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 the anthropogenic, anthropogenic self-regarding uh, uh, the hegemonizer deciding what the non-human really does, that particular thing really ends. Because when one gets into this state of individuation, as I pointed out, 
the agencies agencies multiply the agencies become more it becomes a splatter to 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 to, to put a technical term it becomes a splatter and at the same time this agencies also gets connected to different kinds of non-anthropogenic agencies that we are talking about culture is not something that we build we in the sense of the the, the anthropos Culture is not in the sense in which we build it. Culture also comes out of the non-anthropos direction or an non-anthropos potencies that surround us. So interestingly, um, the, the, the area that, um, the, that you were hinting at is that even if we talk about this word post and the kind of post that, uh, that exists, whatever we are talking about, this post will have a certain kind of difficulty a certain kind of uh certain kind of um you could say the antinomies that would come where um agencies related to the anthropos and agencies related to the non-anthropos will come together and will produce what you consider as the cultural or the political or the social understanding related to the individuation so i think the new materialist dimension would be important here and um, also studies that look into the the post anthropogenic ways of looking at things i think this would be uh, clearly that what i was trying to get at so uh, making something is not just anthropically centered making something also has its non anthropos dimension but they are not in opposition to each other don't think that these people these two paradigms are in opposition there is a kind of there is a kind of a i would say a restive trans dialectic if you if you want to use the christavian term it's a kind of a trans dialectic that builds between these two different agencies yes sir. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you sir yeah so, Ronan, the next question is from Devograta Odikari. Uh -huh. uh, yes. This question is, can we identify the term metastable equilibrium with fluctuating certainty or undulating certainty? Also, uh, yeah, can yeah. the term, yeah. mm. this, the next part, this next part of the question, can mm. the term incommensurability be related mm. with the dialectic relation of one material object with another? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, that's a that's a different way of expressing it. I mean, if you say uh, the the question of certainty, the unstable certainty, that, that's the term you use, right? Unstable certainty, that's what's the term you're using? And um, 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 uh, metastable equilibrium with fluctuating certainty or... Yes, fluctuating, yeah, 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 fluctuating certainty. I mean, uh, that's, a, that's a good term to use here, but I think... Um, uh there, there there is so much to say here i, I would say that this word fluctuation um this is a very important term here because fluctuation would just not be uh blipping in and out or that kind of moving in and moving out syndrome fluctuation is something that is so much an ontological reality of our existence so much an ontological uh aspect of our understanding of any kind of thing any kind of agencies that we talk about so um and also the very idea of certainty i mean um i would i i would probably need another uh while if i don't breath of a time to talk about certainty because certainty is a philosophical discourse and uh, this 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 idea of the certainty uncertainty and relativism they come together within a very strong philosophical discourse springing from the post enlightenment so um your term is interesting I, I i love this term which you said the fluctuating certainty um but uh, remember something that uh, this fluctuating certainty should not be considered as a kind of a monolith it should not be considered as a kind of a structured conceptual entity uh this is this is just a way of looking at reality this is just a way of looking at the ways of thinking that we are surrounded by because um fluctuating certainty um in this very interesting oxymoronic uh potency that it develops i think again it comes back to this idea about this membranic thinking if you connect this with the membranic thinking you would see that how exactly these two areas about fluctuation and certainty needs to have a kind of a membranic thinking in between so that you make better sense of that idea 
Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Now, the next question is from Jyoti Shmita Sarkar. She yes. says, from what I understand so far, ontogenesis, from what I understand so far, ontogenesis is a concept which reminds me of Ofeban. To what degree can they be used interchangeably? Um, can you can you just type out this question? I couldn't hear you clearly. Uh, is is Jyotishmita? Can you type this question out? I just want to have a look. Can I read, 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 read again. Yeah, yeah. Please do. I didn't get it. From what I understand so far, ontogenesis is a concept which reminds me of of a bang. To what degree can they be used interchangeably? Okay. Um, if you're talking about the Ofebong, um, uh, uh, then obviously, yes, I mean, to an extent you can, but I think uh, this, this, this Ofebong, if you are, if I'm getting the pronunciation right for you, are you referring to Hegel? Shmita. Yes, Shmita, are you referring to Ofebong as the, yes, sir, yes, sir. the Hegelian Sublation. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. So, yeah, that that's what I'm that's interested in. So, Offerbung is that sublation that you're talking about. Yes, um, um, I don't think these two things would really come together, and there is not much of a purchase that probably one can draw bringing these two concepts together. Because I think uh, if you are talking about the, the Hegelian aspect of it, I think Hegel doesn't talk about ontogenesis here. I think ontogenesis would probably be uh, more, more, more attuned to or approximate probably in the the third wave cyber cybernetic theory, and uh, in these this cyberneticism or the third wave cybernetic theory would more come more closely to uh, ontogenesis, like the the Catherine Halsey and way of looking at network. But um, the Ophelbaum that of Hegel is more is, is more related to the supersession of consciousness. It's more related to the very idea of the supersession that Hegel talks about, and the supersession is uh, something that I do not see uh, very much close to the idea of ontogenesis here. Yeah. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, Ranjanda, can we take more questions? We have a list of questions. Okay, I mean, I've just been trying. Okay, fine, no problem. Okay. So we, can, we can take questions till nine, that's okay. For me. Okay, okay. So, we have time. So, the next question is from Nabonita Roy. She's asking, Sir, in the moment of pre-individuality, could we say the phenomenon is absent, but its materiality, structurality, already always exists, or existed. Could we then think of the concept of pre-individuality as something that refutes Cartesian subject that I exist before I am thought of in an eerie, I can, oh, um, uh, can, you, can you repeat this question again because it's a long one. I, I can you it again. Yeah. Uh, in the moment of pre-individuality, could we say the phenomenon is absent? But its materiality, structurality, already always exists or existed. This is hmm. the first. That's question. true. That's true because um, uh, the the phenomenon did not the, the phenomenon was very much there. I mean, whether you call it uh, the the pre phenomenon of understanding phenomenon in the present, that is that is that is where the the the, the basic crux of the understanding comes from. Because um, if if one there, you know, there is a distinction that one makes about uh, the phenomenology looking into the idea of the phenomenon and how uh, the how phenomenon probably would be looked at from a very Kantian standpoint as well. I think the to say phenomenon uh, would would for me, if this is this is where you get into the philosophical sharpness of the rigor of the understanding, then I would say you have to specify exactly the what kind of a phenomenon you're talking about and which philosophical tradition you are trying to bring that into because if it is that so if it's the phenomenological tradition and you're falling on the the the, the post to serlian down to Emilio ponti and the rest then it becomes a different kind of understanding but if you are going back to the 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 Kantian way of looking at phenomenon then obviously um that's a different argument i um 
I would I would seek more clarification for this question because if you're looking at Kant, then the Kant the phenomena is a very different different kind of understanding. But if one gets to this idea of Ponti, then phenomena is a very different kind of understanding. So it's very important for me to know exactly what what kind of tradition are you looking at before we can clarify this answer. Yes. Any um, any other questions, uh, sir? Uh, yes, can I ask some questions? Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. So basically, I was um, comparing the idea of transinfusionized thought magma, or the cosmopolitan mix of ideas that that are building. Uh, kind of, I, I was comparing that thought with the uh, with the plurality of onikantovat or the many sidedness of Jainism. And I was just uh, reading Devi Prasad Chattavadhyay the other day, the Shadvad mm -hmm. uh, uh, prediction, and there was this equation of JBS Holden. Mm -hmm. And uh, when the equation is x to the power 2 minus 3x plus 2 is equal to 0, mm -hmm. then x can be either 1 or 2. Or if I remember correctly, there are um, uh, there another equation where x to the power 3 minus x to the power 2 plus x minus 1 is equal to 0, then x can be 1 or plus minus root minus 1, something like that. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I was just saying this: all these possibilities in transinfusionized reading of the literary can simultaneously retain the form and the formability of all these kind of local brackets. So I was just making a comment. Mm -hmm. How can you uh, compare this with the Sadbad and Anikantavad? Uh, is yes, I understand. Really Omega, I, uh, maybe that from the when, the when I do the next uh, session with you and when I start to talk about the bracket and uh, um, when I start to speak about a little more on mathematics and uh, things will be even, even more clear because um, I think uh, there is uh, more, to, more to our understanding than what we have actually done when we look at how Michel Serre looks at mathematics mm -hmm. and how uh, Michel says looking at the mathematics is a way of looking at the understanding of the epistemological complications and epistemological negotiations that goes around us. Even, 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 even if that be a kind of a cultural thinking or even it be post-cultural thinking or political thinking for that matter. So the, the, the equation that you're talking about is, is again coming back to what Shubayu mentioned about the X. Mm -hmm. Uh, something that again I will speak about next time when I talk about and talk to you next time when I talk about the X and how X becomes such an important factor for uh, the, the the French Greek philosopher like Cornelius Castoriot is talking about the idea of the X. Um, uh, you know this 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 idea of the transinfusion that you mentioned is 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 very much rooted to the bracket because transinfusion when you write the write the word you, you you never miss the bracket because if you miss the bracket in the word in in if you're missing that then you're missing the whole word because that just becomes a word i think the that is not so inane that is not so fair and that is not so innocent a word because this this bracket that you put around in changes the way that you start to think because you can call it transfusion you can call it infusion you can call it trans infusion so um there are lots of things that start to get played into or played up so i my point would be here uh to 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 so if you can wait out a little and see what i actually do with you in the second class where there is more about this bracketing and mathematics that i will bring in and obviously and obviously something that I'm going to do is about bringing more Hegel into it because um, this, this idea of the literary has a lot to do with totality and how this totality is uh, not, not something like, uh, uh, to use the word that Luke Nossi uses about unitotality. It's not about a unitotality, but totality as a kind of a dispersed entity, totality as a kind of a shared entity. So shared in the sense of uh, not shared, I mean shared entity. So we will look into this much in, 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 in more intensely when we uh, see each other next time. Yes. Hello, okay. sir. Good evening. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm Ravi. Yes. Yes. Uh, sir, I have a question. Uh, when you talked yeah. about like synchronization, mm -hmm. 
like uh, like even in physics like everything is secretizing like every particle is coming together yeah. like it's a theory in physics and also you talked about uh, like magnetic like three magnets if you if you put and all that yeah. and then uh, when i read like uh, deleuze and guattari uh, so he gave a term called rhizome uh, hmm. so he talked about like uh, uh, rhizome is a botanical term you know where grass you know grows randomly yes. and you also talked about you know that uh, uh, there is there is everything is in random there is no uh, such uh, uh, sort of like uh, you talked about uh, there is a center but uh, but you know uh, guattari and deleuze they said that there is no center there is no such thing as a center uh, they are constantly growing you know in term of like postmodernism like it's thing uh, like deconstructing like when we deconstructing something uh, it's it's like there is no center at all this is what he talked about but so you talked about that there is a center but it's a fragile center so my question is like uh, what could be that fragile center uh, that you talked about like how can we you know implement uh, in um, yes i get you i did, i i said that this is a position that i have very uh, deeply invested in at this moment yes, and this position is about structure i don't see anything i don't see anything that was i mentioned even if it be sense or nonsense whatever you do there has to be that logic behind it and there is all the time a structure which is why when i have uh, taught and written on plasticity i have always considered that to be a structured plasticity so i mentioned this part that uh, when i said about center i said that you talk about disruption of center you talk about decentering recentering or you talk about dislocation i say it's a called a fragile center i say it's a vulnerable center but center nonetheless any kind of any kind of a thought any kind of a concept any kind of a system that you build there there would be this fragile center to it and why say fragile because this fragility is a part of the center's regrowth this fragility is also a part of the center denying its own centrality this fragility is also a part of the center asking questions about its legitimacy as a center so you know this is the fragility that i've spoken about and um deleuze uh, when on batari when they speak about rhizomatism then i think um, uh, they progressed a lot after that i mean there is also very important for one to see how deleuze talks about the capitalism because uh, when you talk about when 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 deleuze speaks about capitalism then his capitalism is a structure that continuously starts to dismantle itself if you are looking at capitalism as a structure that settles in sovereignizes itself and in the end or eventually hegemonizes the other that's not the kind of capitalism that deleuze talks about the capitalism for deleuze would be where capitalism becomes its own reason its own cause for dismantling so you know this rhizome for me is not just about a network that you build exteriorly there is no exteriority of network that for me rhizome can, the rhizome in a way sponsors or inspires me to think rhizome for me that's the way i that's the way i i tangentially read to those rhizome for me is this transductive interiority the point that i mentioned it's a kind of a transductive interiority with which rhizome functions that is when you know that you are not connected you are connected when you thought that you are connected you know that the disconnections are there i mean when you are aware of disconnections you know that disconnections actually provide you with the platform or the foundations to get connected so you know this way of not being able to understand uh uh, uh over understand misunderstand this continues and which is the reason why this this term that i just came across with using fluctuations of certainty exists because certainty if it becomes understanding any kind of understanding is a kind of question that you ask yourself because you know uh understanding comes with two things to it one is your agnosis that is the ignorance and another is your 
wise acreness or your comprehensibility. So what you actually consider as the certainty is your understanding built on the structures or the crutches of the limbs of certainty. This is what you do with knowledge. But every knowledge is very much ontologically or, 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 or should I say every knowledge in a way is centered with a fragile center called agnosis. Agnosis is one of the reasons why you build knowledge. You cannot oppositionalize uh, uh, knowledge with ignorance or agnosis for that matter. So um, one last point here uh, before, before I move to the next question is that if you go back to lead, uh, read uh, Fossier Larule, uh, who talks about this non-philosophy, then in the non-philosophy of philosophy, which one looks into that, then the person tries to see the network between knowledge, non and anti-knowledge. How these three things can come together to produce, as I said, the fragile center of understanding. This is one of the reasons, one of the ways of also question, responding to the question about fluctuations of certainty. We will talk about this much more as I bring non-philosophy into my discussion later. Yeah, sir, uh, sir uh, this is Albert you, speaking. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, sir. Move Moving on to the primordial philosopher, uh, considering Aristotelian philosophical thinking of the ideas or structures in the celestial, celestial world and the earthly realm, what will be the role of the membranic thinking considering either the rigidity or the lucidity of traversing from the ethereal world to the temporal world or vice versa if possible, since we start from a structure since we always start from a structure or there is a temptation to start from structure, what will be the role of this membranic thinking? Well, uh, um, that puts me in a spin here because um, <laughs> I actually never thought, I, I didn't think about that because this is a very, as you said, it is a deeply primordial question because uh, um, Aristotle, um, well, Aristotle talks about uh, structuring. Aristotle talks about uh, very interesting ideas about bronze in his book, The Metaphysics. Um, uh, but uh, I think uh, uh, connecting Aristotle with uh, the membranic thinking that I mentioned would read a far more post-Aristotelian ideas. Uh, I mean, it's, it would be a, a lot of extending Aristotle uh, beyond what the, the way he thought of things, because uh, mm, the membranic thinking that I'm talking about is primarily something that starts to challenge this productionist metaphysics of understanding. If you go by Heidegger, uh, this this productionist metaphysics of understanding is what Aristotle basically is. Uh, something belongs to and something that I have been challenging, or rather I shouldn't say challenging, I'm trying to revise my understanding of. So. Uh, this question probably is too expansive at this moment to take on because in that case I have to discuss with you Aristotle on form, uh, Aristotle and structure, and then move on to see how I look at membranic thinking. So maybe uh, sometime later we can pick this up. Yes, yeah. sir. thank you, yeah. sir. Well, it was intriguing me. That's why. Yeah, thank you, sir. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Okay. Is it? Is it that? I think that ends everything, Pradipto. For the we have a few more questions, but we can we can uh, place these questions later in the next class. Yes, I I'm think in, uh, I'm in the next class. Yes, surely, because it's going to be a continuation of things, so mm -hmm. um, that would be easier. I will I will um, announce my uh, next class lecture uh, very soon, but. Uh, uh, you can stay subscribed to that YouTube channel so that you get the reminders once once I uh, announce a class and uh, uh, it gets uploaded on the YouTube channel. You get a reminder through the subscription, so that that will be easier for you people to follow it up. So we will upload the fresh uh, recording. Uh, yes, that the channel good. because I think there was a problem in the live stream due to the bad weather. Okay. So uh, so this recording is ready. So once okay. we, we, we have finished with the processing of the recording, we will upload it. Okay. 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 That's fine. Okay. That's Thank fine. you, Roger, for such an engaging session. Thanks Thank a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. See you next. See Thank you. Bye. Bye.
Okay.